Hello friends, welcome to another segment on the cholinergic system. Now in this series so far, we've discussed choline as, a, uh, as an essential nutrient. We've discussed how uh, choline uh, turns into the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We've discussed the critical role of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in cognition, particularly in the cases of uh, cognitive diseases like Alzheimer's and depression. Uh, we've also discussed the role of the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, which uh, breaks down co acetylcholine in the brain, and how the manipulation of acetylcholinesterase has been used to treat the symptoms of several uh, kinds of cognitive diseases, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, senile dementia, and Tourette's as well. And we've discussed pharmaceutical and herbal uh, tools that can be used to inhibit acetylcholinesterase reversibly. At this point in the series, we will finally begin discussing the receptors in detail. So specifically what we're going to discuss is the cholinergic receptors in the brain. We're going to not discuss the ones that are not in the brain. And we're going to begin in this episode with the muscarinic cholinergic receptors. So first of all, before anything else, I'd like to point your attention to the link down below, which will link to my blog. You will be able to read an accompanying, accompanying uh, literature to this video, and the same will exist for all future videos and exist for all previous videos. So that you can access the detailed citations that I took when preparing my 15,000 word, 25 page uh, literature review, which has over 200 citations, which are basically a review of the study of the cholinergic system in the 20th century and 21st century. So now getting right down to it, the cholinergic, so cholinergic neurons are neurons that have cholinergic receptors. Now there are two categories, as I described earlier, of cholinergic receptors. They, and they are, because both kinds uh, are receptive to acetylcholine, the, the main neurotransmitter of the cholinergic system but they differ in their response to uh, exogenous uh, chemicals that also agonize the same receptors. So for example, there is a nicotinic, nicotinic cholinergic receptor and there is a muscarinic cholinergic receptor. These are the two broad categories. Uh, specifically, in this episode, we're gonna talk about the muscarinic cholinergic receptors. Those are receptors that respond to something called muscarine. Now, Muscarine is a toxic mushroom substance that's a chemical that's found in some well-known mushrooms, including the Amanita muscaria that is featured, featured quite a bit on YouTube and uh, people that in communities that are interested in psilocybin mushrooms as well. Um, mu muscarine is uh, a chemical that was identified and isolated uh, by a couple of Germans, uh, namely Schmeideberg and Kropp from the University of uh, Dorset, I think, or Dorpat, um, in the mid-19th century. It was the first parasympathomimetic substance ever discovered, that it agonized the parasympathetic nervous system. And because of its early discovery and its effect on helping uh, scientists learn about the cholinergic receptors, it gave its name to five cholinergic receptors, namely M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5. And those five cholinergic receptors that are muscarinic cholinergic receptors correspond to five exact genes that are called CHRMs. CHRM1 corresponds to the M1 receptor, it codes for it, and CHRM5 co uh, codes for the um, M5 receptor. So, you can learn about your individual polymorphisms of the uh, muscarinic receptors by checking out your genes for CHRM1 through CHRM5. Now, out of these five receptors, scientists have learned that M1 and M4 are particularly relevant to cognition. Now, the thing is, the reason why muscarine is so toxic is because the other M, uh, muscarinic receptors are very, very relevant to physiological uh, processes. And in general, they don't seem that relevant to psychological processes. Although, 
M5 maybe a little bit, but M1 and M4 are the ones that have been found to be re very relevant to, cognitive, to cognition. So, for example, in knockout mice, that is, as I said before, mice that have had a gene knocked out, they're called KO mice. The ones that have had the gene for M5, M1 and M4 knocked out, either one, experience visible cognitive deficits. Whereas the ones who have had M1 knocked out also exhibit hyperactivity, which is interesting. It may show that uh, the M1, muscarinic cholinergic receptor 1, plays a particular role in attention as well. Nonetheless, um, although M5 are the only receptors that are actually found in VTA dopaminergic neurons, the M1 receptor is found throughout the hippocampus and cortex of the brain. Now, it has a couple of interesting effects as well that you wouldn't immediately think of. So we've mentioned the potential role in cognition and attention, but it also may have a neuroprotective effect in that it has been tied to the alpha secretase enzyme, which decreases beta amyloid in the brain. You'll recall from our discussions of Alzheimer's disease in earlier episodes that Alzheimer's disease is now known to depend on the buildup of two things in the brain. One are called beta amyloid plaques, which are plaques of misfolded proteins in the brain. And the second one are called tau, triangle, ta uh, tau tangles. Sorry. Tau tangles are not very well understood, but beta amyloid plaques are better understood. And we do know that the alpha secretase enzyme helps to decrease the levels of beta amyloid in the brain. So it can be thought that the M1 receptor plays a key role in limiting the rate at which beta amyloid accumulates in the brain. And therefore, agonizing the M1 receptor may be uh, helpful and productive in a neuroprotective way. Uh, secondly, um, the, and this is unexpected, completely unexpected, but the M1 receptor has also been shown to attenuate liver, acute liver injury. So in mice that have had liver injury, agonizing the M1 receptor uh, attenuates or limits the damage done from the liver injury. Now, a final note I'd like to mention in this first introductory video on the muscarinic cholinergic receptors is that the agonizing, which means stimulating or binding to uh, receptors M1 and M4, which are critical to cognition, also appears to modulate dopaminergic neurons in uh, some way, which may not be very desirable. So it's been shown that agonizing the M1 and the M4 receptors, either one of them, causes mice to exhibit less dopamine-dependent behavior. So, for example, an addictive behavior. Um, this is done when uh, M1 is agonized alone, but when M1 and M4 are both agonized, it is much more uh, visible. So this is a concern because, as I mentioned in, in an earlier video, um, if someone does not have a pathological addictive state, we want to keep their dopaminergic system working as efficiently as possible, and we don't want to be uh, inadvertently affecting it without intending to, because it is critical to drive, and drive is critical to learning, and you know it's, it's just a, a, an important part of our system. In the next video, I'm going to introduce you guys to uh, some muscarinic cholinergic agonists. And this is very important to learn about because, you know, even though we talked about the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, what those things do is raise acetylcholine in the brain, and acetylcholine is indiscriminate. It is non-selective. It will agonize all the muscarinic cholinergic receptors as well as all the nicotinic cholinergic receptors. But the thing is, we also find that higher levels of acetylcholine in the brain are correlated to depression. So maybe the best way to uh, utilize the cholinergic system to improve our cognition is to be selective. And for that purpose, we really have to know about these different receptors and be aware of what compounds can activate them. So in the next video, we're going to discuss the compounds that can activate the muscarinic receptors. Thank you so much for listening, and I wish you a fruitful day.